Hey crafties, welcome to another episode of the Arena Craft Podcast, a show focused exclusively on Magic the Gathering Arena. I'm one of your hosts, Arjuna. Regular co-host Kovako Blue is continuing his sabbatical, so he'll be gone for a little while. But in the meantime, we do have another special guest today, which I'm excited to introduce here in a moment. First of all, I just wanted to say Happy New Year. Hope, uh, you know, best wishes for 2022. Hope it's a better year than 2021 was for a lot of us. So we'll see how it goes, but we definitely have a lot to look forward to in the world of magic. And uh, thanks for sticking with us on the show. It means a lot to me, and I'm really excited to see what this new year is going to bring. Uh, also, we're not going to record an outro for this video. Um, I, I recorded separately with our guest. So, you know, I'm just going to say, uh, you know, we usually have an outro spiel where you can find the show. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're on iTunes. We're on all the usual places. You can catch Covert Go Blue and I streaming on Twitch. Um, we have a Discord. We have a Patreon. We appreciate it if you hang out in those as well. It's really helpful to us. So anyway, without further ado... Let me go ahead and introduce our special guest today. It's actually a returning guest of the podcast, Michael J. Flores. And we're really fortunate to have Michael with us again. Um, he's just, you know, basically he's one of the longest standing content creators in the Magic community and a foundational and original article writer. Uh, he actually wrote perhaps the most famous Magic article of all time, Who's the Beatdown? Highly recommended read even now. It's really excellent. Taught a lot of people uh, some really important foundational concepts of magic. But uh, anyway, he's been writing for years. Uh, he's also produced a lot of different kinds of content, uh, many podcasts, including the Top Level Podcast, which is one of mine and Kovac Go Blue's favorite ongoing podcasts. But, you know, Pro Tour competitor, absolutely top class magic player, and... Uh, entertaining personality, Michael J. Flores. So looking forward to rolling this for you. And uh, like I said before, Happy New Year. Patrick and I have lost more than one full episode over the yeah. years, but usually we just record it again the next day. And, he, you know, he was a, I hate to say like he's a good sport about it, but like if I'm like the one who's in charge of all the technical things, I have to say that he's a good sport about it. You know, like, <laughs> so, you know I mean, <laughs> he, he always used to say, <laughs> he was far less than 50% of what was going on. <laughs> so I don't know what the exact percentages are, but I'm less than 50%. Okay. Thank Man, you, I guess. I, uh, dude, every, every podcast is that way in my experience. I mean, this basically Kovac Go Blue shows up, puts his butt in the chair and talks for an hour. And I that's... Mean, he, for a guy who did a thousand straight days of YouTube video, like, I was, so I was like scooping up for myself. I'm like, I could do that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I would actually, I don't, I wouldn't think I would aspire to seven days a week. Yeah. Like maybe five days a week. So maybe I, maybe I can make like 80% of Covert Go Blues, uh, you know, Scrooge McDuck esque millions of gold ducats <laughs> from YouTube videos. But I was just like, he doesn't even do a lot of the work, right? He outsources everything. He does. Does yeah. he just, does he just like cut his, because he's streaming, right? And then he just like, because his, his YouTube is so much better than everybody else's YouTube. It's like far better than everybody else's YouTube. But I've watched his stream and his yeah. stream is equally sucky to everybody else's stream. Yeah. So I'm like, somehow this stream, because I can't stand streaming, yeah, but I yeah. love his videos, right? Yeah. So I'm like, somehow this stream, which is like equally, uh, uh, <laughs> uh the people are just like, uh, uh, it's their whole stream, right? Yeah. And then it gets to this like, bantery like yeah. you know it, this whatever it, 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 i don't know it, it somehow it transforms on this no so he he actually does record the videos separately for the most part yeah. um and i'll and i'll give you the secret is that he records he'll record like three days worth of content in one day right yeah so that's how he manages to not go totally insane is he'll just but then yeah does he pretend to do live commentary? Because what I used to do is I would record the games and yeah. I would pretend to do live commentary. Oh, and I'm just no. like, I, and I would just be like, and I know what's going to happen. And be like, oh, wouldn't it be weird if? And then oh, like, man. Oh, wow, that so happened. You, then you look like a genius. Yeah, no, I'm, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure he's just, just doing it straight, like live off the cuff. Um, I think one of the brutal things, though, is that, you know, he has to record every single game like it's going on the video, right? But I mean, I'm sure at least 50% of them don't. 
So I, I don't even I don't get how he cuts. We should just put this in the in the podcast. <laughs> this is just probably this in, yeah. more it's interesting. But I, first of all, also Google will like it. Um, but like, I think this is actually uh, so. But I, it's like arbitrary. Like I'm watching like a, an event, right? So in my head, an event is seven games, unless you you know you die early, right? So you just play an event. He's like, I'm going to show you three games. <laughs> One of the games was long. One of the games was boring. <laughs> so I cut the boring game. I'm like, I, I don't know, man. But like, try to watch the event here. Oh man. This is this see, this is old school versus new school, right? Because the new school, it's all about that engagement, man. It's all about that, like, you know, if the games aren't fire, the peep you know, he's no. watching his graphs go down, right? Yeah, but the the <laughs> so I don't get that's I think Covert Go Blue personally like ruined, I think, the 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 game for for, maybe for himself, because he clearly had the best hustle going on. And everyone else was like, Twitch, 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 Twitch. Yeah. And he was like the one who was like the YouTube kingpin. Now, everybody's trying to get on YouTube or whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, like, not that everybody's watchable, but like, I I would just, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm, it's like a Saturday night and I'm like bored and, you know, nothing's going on. I'll, I'll, I'll throw on Twitch. It's not Twitch.tv. I just have an app, right? So I open mm. the app. And I'm like, all right, I'll scroll through magic content. And like, most of it stinks. Like, you know, I'm just watching. And the thing that would get me is like, this guy's playing at mythic level and he just doesn't even understand his own matchups. Like, I watched, like, I edit, this is my own fault. I watched some guy for like two hours. I couldn't tell you who it was one night. And he's like playing mono green in mythic and he just keeps losing to control decks. And he doesn't understand that he's in a bad matchup. He's just like, I, I don't know why I keep losing this. I don't know, because they all have rats, and you have all dudes, and you just keep playing dudes into their rats. I don't know, Arjuna. I don't know Dude. about I don't know about these content creators these days. I mean, all I'm saying, man, is that there's a large space waiting and ready for you. So, you know. I, I thought about it. I'm like, maybe I could just be a professional content creator. And then I then I'm like, no, nah, I think I'm going to get a job instead. That will uh, be what I do. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you've been doing all of these years, but I, right, I so, thought that that already applied to you there. So I had it. I mean, I came to New York to run the dojo. Yeah, I did that for a while. And then I mostly had jobs. And then I was like, then I, I was always writing. Right. Like I was writing since when I was in college. I started I started getting paid to write around 98. So I wrote for Mark Rosewater. Right. So I wrote for a print magazine. Oh, uh, no way. Called The Duelist Sideboard uh, for Mark Rosewater. That was my first professional. I mean, I had contracts. I had to get stuff in on time. So I had like I. So hold on. So this was separate from Duelist, right? Which was like. Duelist Sideboard. Okay. Actually. No, no, I think I wrote for the Duelist now that you now that you mentioned. The Duelist and the Duelist Sideboard were two different magazines. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think I wrote for the Duelist now that you mentioned. So I, yeah. I literally was a professional magazine writer in 98, 99. Um and uh that was before I got paid to write for the dojo, right? So I had always wrote for like Usenet, right? That was like text-based stuff. And Frank Kusumoto, who was the original sensei of the dojo, would just pull things that were good off of Usenet and he would put it on the dojo. Like basically, like I don't know, stealing. People, people got a kick out of it, right? Like, yeah. You know, we got wider publication, uh, and then I think it was the summer of '98. I was at Nationals, and Frank just like handed a ton of product to me, right? Like, and I had never been compensated for online articles I'd written, so he'd give me like hundreds and hundreds of dollars in in, in sealed product, and I didn't want to take it. Like, I it wasn't a thing that I did, mm. so. Then I like ran the dojo for a few years. Then I, I just had a regular job after that, but my friends were still running the dojo. And so I made a, at the time I thought like a dumb amount of money for writing magic articles. Like I used to say, like, I lived in New York and I could pay all my bills on my, on my, on my, um, yeah, that's on my magic writing, like by no 2000 mean feet. Right. So, uh, and then Chapin says, like, I, I like, I really kind of made the game like around 2003, uh, and then like, I was like the first star city premium writer, like really like it, it, not that I was the first, like, I think like technically like Mark young, who is a friend of mine still, who is in New York movie club and stuff. I think he had the first article printed under the star city banner. Cause he was on a Monday. Mm. Right. But like, uh, you know, just patting myself on the head. If you want to say like, who are the people who were carrying the subscriptions loads, right? Like. Mm. 
through the generations that have been like Zvi, then me, then Patrick, um, you know, that, that was, uh, that was the thing that I did for a long stretch. And I made a, you know, decent amount of money writing magic articles from 2003 to 2014 or whatever. Mm. Um, and then started doing podcasting around 2006, 2005, something like that off and on. And then we did started doing top level, around 2014, I think, which was obviously my most sustained, consistent effort on the podcasting front to date. But yes, to answer your question, as I mostly had a job most of the time, Mm. um, I've never been a full-time magic content creator. Uh, Although maybe I was, I think like maybe I just was the equivalent of somebody who had three jobs. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I think I did. Yeah. So you I did that for a while. Side hustle game, you know? Yeah. So I, I think that's probably more accurate. Like I, I, I mean, I live in New York City, right? I think it probably if I lived somewhere else and maybe if I didn't have a family I was supporting, I would have had a different outlook on how yeah. much money you were making writing magic articles or whatever. But I guess I, I just had the equivalent of somebody who had three jobs, right? So uh, I did that for a long time. I mean, that's not sustainable for a 40-something year old person, right? I was sleeping like two hours a night or whatever for 10 years. Wow. Uh, so <laughs> Okay. That's the answer to how he does it, folks. <laughs> yeah, so uh, and then I, I mean, obviously I took the foot off the accelerator, but I, um, yeah, I just had some changes in my life, uh, my personal life this year that were all super positive, but mm. just kind of figuring out, um, what I might want to do next. And if there was a window there, including my accounting guy slash tax attorney, John Becker, uh, former magic, the gathering pro tour player was just like, why don't you just be a professional <laughs> magic content creator? It sounds like Cooper Koblu does pretty well. <laughs> He he is doing a lot better than a lot of content creators out there. So, and I mean, he's he's a big fan of your work. So, all I'm, I'm saying is work. there's a, a golden throne available for you. Should well, you choose to accept it. Um, well, well, probably not. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I have the wherewithal, right? So, yeah, I think like maybe if I if maybe this was 10, 10 years ago, I was trying to do this, like. If this was 20 years ago, I think I, I might have had a different bite. I, people don't believe it. When I was in law school, I played Magic 40 hours a week. I was always Whoa. on the Pro Tour back then. Whoa. And I, I played 40 hours a week in Magic while I was in law school. So, so, so that was uh, Moto? You were no, that Moto. was... that. There was no Moto then. I'm talking okay. about like 99. Uh, um, okay. I played against myself on Apprentice. Uh, a lot so <laughs> okay i found out that uh that people are like well how come kai bude is so good that's the question mm. right so i mean i also played real life tournaments right so i was like traveling to tournaments every week but people are like how come kai bude is so good and i found out from eric taylor that kai he was just in kai's hotel room and he's just like the reason kai does so well is because he cares the most and we're like what do you mean he cares the most he's like walks into his hotel room it's like 6 a.m everybody's asleep Kai has two two apprentice windows open and he's playing the top eight matchup against himself, right? <laughs> so I'm like, this is how you do it? So then I was just like, I became uh, that, like certainly like maybe like mid, mid-aughts, like around 2004. I was like so prolific at, at articles and so prolific at good deck design. I was mostly playing against myself on Apprentice back then. And um, like... You get a lot of data through and you get a lot of questions answered and you fix a lot of problems if you know how to do this properly. And approaching playing against yourself on Apprentice is extraordinarily difficult in terms of avoiding bias. Mm. But like at some point, mm. if you're punching yourself in the face enough, you learn. I would say that Moto ruined that. So uh, the last deck that I made that way that was like really of good substantial uh like notoriety as i was probably critical mass and what happened was that's the first time i logged into my god account on moto and i played critical mass on moto and i just never lost and i'm like oh this is so much it's like it was just user interface wise it was so much easier to just get games on Mm -hmm. but like my volume of games went down like you could play if you're just playing against yourself you know what both decks are you're trying to hit the matchups right like you could play I don't know. I probably did like a 10 game set before work every day. Right. Wow. Less than an hour. And you just get like, I, I, I don't know. I, I understood. I just, I understand certain matchups so well, just because I just played both sides of them. Right. And so that was, uh, that was, I guess 
don't know if I ever talked about this much. The, 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 that was like the big secret of that of that era. Um, and then Moto came and I just, I got lazy. I just got like everybody else. And you, you don't think of Moto grinders as being lazy, right? But compared to what I used to do. <laughs> that was well, lazy. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, you're only playing half the matchup, right? So, <laughs> well, yeah. And also <laughs> the amount of time you're doing it, right? Like yeah. how many games do you get in an hour? Like three, you're probably getting like 10 games playing both sides in an hour. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're playing as yourself on apprentice, no rope on Moto, right? So yeah, it's so kind of, yeah, exactly. But, well, that's uh, no, that's actually really cool to kind of peer behind the curtain. Right. Because I think it's, like a, a lot of people have the the perspective that before Moto, it was just like testing houses. Right. Or like maybe you had like someone who was no, lucky enough to live with some other magic players. Or testing whatever. houses was later. OK, first, of all, I also lived with a bunch of magic players. Right. So, so that around helps. 2000. Well, so the, the dojo was like our original thought was that we were all going to be millionaires out of the dojo. Right. So that that didn't happen. I mean, it happened on paper. But like I couldn't spend it at, paper right. at any point, right? The so, money came in, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that 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 didn't happen for me in a in a real way. So what happened ended up happening was around the spring of two thousand, we had all these magic players who basically all lived together, and uh, and we all went to the office together, and we were just like uh, not working very <laughs> relative. Like we we're still getting the dojo up, right? But we were working mm. really hard, like trying to build like a legitimate, you know startup business before then mm. and so i don't know i just spent every afternoon figuring out one ofs in my black vampiric tutor deck and lo and behold you do that for like two months straight you end up with a pretty good deck <laughs> <laughs> it turns out the time in is still an important part of the equation for sure that's that's a funny ish story so i qualified with napster for nationals and so i was on the testing team with john finkel and I'm like, I think we have a pretty good, I think I, I said, I, I think I have a pretty good deck. That was my, that was my statement. And it was like, oh, Mike, you always think you have a good deck. So we played a total of three games, Napster against like, I think one game against Blue, two games against Rebels. And John lost the game against Blue. So I said, you should do this. And I think he's playing against Chris Pakula. And he's like, nah, you shouldn't do that. That's wrong. I'm like, you should definitely do this. John lost the game. Then won both games against Rebels. We only played three total constructed testing games total for the national championship john said this deck is obviously the best <laughs> i'm only going to concentrate on limited and then he won the limited he had this was like one of his comebacks he had he had at that point already retired for the first time so nationals 2000 was one of his comebacks and he won the limited portion qualified for the limited masters uh so I guess he was right in concentrating on limited and then won the national championship with a total of three, three. So I, so people are like, Oh my God, how do you get to be the best player ever in the history of magic? How do you have the best deck? He played three games. <laughs> Dan O'Mahony Schwartz made like about, we made a, a decent number of changes from the regionals version of Napster, but uh, like we took out powder kegs for less flexible cards, more bullets and a fourth vampiric tutor. Um, but Three three games of testing, Uh I mean, I, I don't know. Like, you can't mess with that, right? I mean, there's there's some people you just like you can't mess with that. Like, it is what it is, right? It's so so. I mean, it's it's like you've got Kai Buddha on one side, just like getting in more reps than anyone else. Oh yeah, more and, reps than is humanly possible, <laughs> the Kai Buddha. right? And then you've got John Finkel, who's just, I, I don't even know what's in the water that guy drinks. But John didn't, it's not that John didn't want to work, mm. right? John worked, he just worked on limited, mm. right? So yeah. his, his whole thing was like, there's no point in testing this anymore, right? We literally had a deck that if you cast a one casting cost spell, you won every matchup. So what's the point, right? <laughs> He's just like, oh, is Parrish not going to be good against this? Good Stompy this round? Like, <laughs> he, played, he played Stompy like you know, multiple times in the tournament. Um, he had a hard time with Aaron Forsyth though mm. in the top four. Um, Aaron played a deck that we didn't know, so uh, so he had to improvise on the on the on, fly. On the fly, all right. Ex except for he kind of didn't. One of Aaron's roommates had a full seventy five. And I don't know, for, for barnacle purposes, just tested with us the night before. So we learned the oh, matchup no. that way. <laughs> it <laughs> wasn't it, like it. Off the edge. <laughs> it wasn't like how it is now. Like now, yeah. everybody sends all their arena deck lists in, you know, the, you know, 
five days yeah. before the tournament and they're published. Oh right? yeah, Frank Carsten's already done a full analysis yeah, like, before the tournament even there's, starts. There's no surprises now, yeah. right? Yeah. But like you're, you're carrying around like a printout of your, like, I'm sitting at the pro tour, the last pro tour I played in February of 2000 or whatever. You literally like hand your opponent your deck list before the before the game starts, so that they can have a really nicely exhaustive knowledge of what they should be mulling inning into, and you know what tricks you might have in your sideboard, which is insanity to me. From my perspective as a player, like um, when I got back on the Pro Tour, which was like around 2014, 2015, the idea of scouting teams, right? Like having your barns out there with like a list of all the players in the tournament, writing what archetype they had down was such a ridiculously different edge than like, I never had, like, I didn't have that, like in my first generation as a player, um, but then that's, that became very, very common. I mean, it doesn't matter now, like now you literally have to hand people a, I mean, if there were paper tournaments now, you would have to hand your opponent, your deck list. Um, which is what we did. What we did in Phoenix. So, yeah, world changes, man. <laughs> different, different times, man. I mean, I always, I just love getting that perspective, right? Because like, it, sometimes it feels like things have changed so rapidly, and I think it's like it's all of these little incremental changes, right, that have gotten us from from what you're talking about to where we are now. Um, so, Kamigawa's and, coming up. Yeah, dude. So there was a Kamigawa Skins Game Pro Tour in Philadelphia, I want to say 2004 or 2005. I just remember this match so distinctly. Uh, Mark Herberholtz, who ended up making top eight, is playing against Siyushu Fujita, who's a Hall of Famer. Two of the greatest deck designers of all time. Two very different deck designers. Two of the greatest deck designers of all time. And um, I'm lucky enough to know both of them. And he's the has the card cranial extraction in his deck, which is B3. You know, this card has been reprinted in different names, you know, a bunch of different times. Yeah. And he cranial extractions Fujita for the card Mind Blaze, which is like an extraordinarily inefficient fireball type effect, but is theoretically a way that Fujita would be able to win, um, to win the matchup. It doesn't get any hits. And then in game three, <laughs> he does it again, <laughs> does it again. Mind blaze, and you don't they don't have to have it in their hand. You just yeah. it's in their deck, it's okay. Yeah. Misses again. So I asked him afterwards. I'm like, when you might when you cradled him for mind blaze in game two, and it didn't come up, like, why did you cradle him for mind blaze again in game three? He's just like, I was sure he had it. <laughs> why <laughs> he were just you, he's like the soul read, I guess. <laughs> well, no, because some idiot had told Heezy that Fujita had mind blaze oh, no. and he was gonna oh, mind no. blaze him. So he just had a terrible scout, right? So it, that just doesn't happen now, right? You yeah. Know? yeah, 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 yeah. There's no mind blaze in his deck. You can see that. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, okay, so you had actually just gotten around to mentioning, and I'm definitely curious to hear your thoughts about Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, right? Oh, and okay, so this is spoiler alert. I've I've got kind of a sub theme to this conversation, and the sub theme is like old school magic meets new school game design, right? Because we're seeing this in multiple ways. And the, and the first way that I want to address with you is this futuristic setting, right? Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. So like, how do you feel, right? As someone who was there the first time, who went to Kamigawa originally, I mean, what's going through your mind when you're like Kamigawa and holograms? How does that register for you? I care zero. Like I, I was hanging out with uh, uh, some of, some of my friends. Like you might know their names. Like with like Taya Steele a few years ago, and she was telling me a bit about like how much people cared about sliver redesigns. Mm. I guess people really care about sliver redesigns. And this is like ten years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah, they put legs on slivers or whatever they did. You know, whatever <laughs> oh, horrible crime. Yeah, slivers have legs now. Yeah, and I'm like. Why would you possibly care if Slivers have legs? She's like, people. She people care passionately about this, mm. right? So, I don't care, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, I I I look at it and I'm like, um, speaking of Kamigawa, Sakura Tribelder costs one and a G for a one one with a rampant growth ability, and it's a snake, 
I think it might be a, I don't know if it's a snake shaman. I think it's a snake shaman. It's a snake of some kind. Does it bother me that the snake has hands? No. <laughs> it would bother me if I didn't have a basic land in my deck when I sacrificed it. That might bother me. But the fact that the snake the snake has hands does not bother me. Like, I, I think some of the stuff they've done aesthetically is really cool. You know, I, I, I'm a, I get a kick out of it. The thing that, and I just like it. I like watching the preview video. I think the concept of like a fairy tale themed set, the concept of like a, you know, a horror themed set. That's, that's cool. I mean, you got to have some kind of art on the, on the, on the cards. And I think that it's better than it was like years ago. I, there's like some zombie. I remember like calling Aaron Force. I literally just called his phone sitting at his desk at Watsy, like to complain there was like some scourge zombie and he just jacked. He looks like the Hulk. I'm like, yo, this is a zombie. Okay. Like he should be desiccated, right? Like he shouldn't be jacked. Zombies are falling apart. Everybody knows that, right? Like, why is he jacked? Like, why does he look like, you know, a bodybuilder? It's like, I don't know, man. What do you bother me about this? This is a, this is a stupid conversation. Instead, I'm going to complain about that time John Finkel beat me in the Angry Hermit Napster matchup at Nationals 2000. I could have been a contender. Jeez. So, you know, I, I it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me. So they have glowing neon swords. Like, you, we live in a world already that is magic and magic and also like steampunk or something. You know, the weather light is like a mechanical flying mm. ship, right? Karn is a robot, right? Like they got robots. I mean, oh, I don't know, is it Gollum? I don't know, magic robot. I am the wrong person to ask about these sets of the game. All right. So what what I'm getting is that you're not much of a Vorthos. I maybe not, man. <laughs> ask me what like my favorite art is. I have really strong opinion. I have really strong opinions who the best magic artists are, but what okay. the best magic art is. And it's probably people won't agree with me. Um, I think Quentin Hoover is hands down the best magic. Oh, I mean, it's hard to argue, right? Like some of the most classic art ever, Quentin Hoover for sure. Do you do you like, have like a couple favorite cards that just really yeah? There's jump out two cards I think that are just so good. One of them is Regeneration from the original set. Yes, look at Regeneration, man. Amazing just look card. at it. Yeah. Like. It tells the story of what a card named Regeneration would do in simple line art, four yeah. color line art. It yeah. looks fantastic. It tells the story. The other card I think is fantastic. I think a lot of people don't like this one because it, you know, maybe a little political is Earthbind, right? <laughs> okay. Earthbind depicts what would happen if you had a flying creature that was no longer flying and why? Right. And it does so in an incredibly elegant way. Now, whether or not this art should have been commissioned is a different question, but its execution is flawless. I mean, I, I'm definitely here for the line art. I agree that that particular piece hasn't aged so well, but I'm glad I, I'm glad that we're able to acknowledge that. Right. And I'm glad that we're able to see that magic is a it's it's a work in progress, right? So both regeneration and earthbind are spells. Yeah. And I I actually Matt Cavada uh, Matt Cavada came up around the same neighborhood that I came up, and we were PTQ road buddies before he became the art director at Watsi. And he and so there was a time, and I don't know you probably know this about me, like I was trying to be an artist and I was like a very briefly a movie illustrator. I and didn't I know that. Actually. In some of this, I was in a, a high profile uh, art contest. I had a mention in daily variety sometime, I think in 2003. So Matt's like, this is really cool, right? People don't know this about you. Uh, and uh, so he commissioned me to do a piece for what would have been saviors of Kamigawa, I think either betrayers of Kamigawa or saviors of Kamigawa. No way. And he's just like, you draw it, you do your thing, which is going to be line art, and then I'll paint it on top. That was the thing. Uh, and I didn't do a good enough job. And so he just ended up painting, like, not a great Matt Cavada piece. You know, it's like a very, like, Matt Cavada had 15 minutes left to do, to do this piece because I didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> okay. I can tell you yeah. that um, the reason for that isn't because I can't draw, right? That's a different question. It is because depicting spells isn't that easy. So I think mm. both Regeneration and Earthbind do an amazing job of depicting what a spell would do, 
and telling the story of that spell. And like, I think I was supposed to do something. I, I think the, the, the playtest name of the card was something like blade rush or something, but it, it ended up being the card hundred talent strike from one of the Kamigawas. Mm. And, uh, so I just like made like a ninja looking dude with like, I think like he, the, the, it was just like, there's, if I can recall, like the art direction was like spirits in this upcoming set. The set hadn't come out yet, obviously have lanterns around. Them, right. And like you're basically, and you know, this is going to be like a first strike ish sort of card, right? Like that's the extent of the, the notes I got. So I drew like a ninja looking guy with some paper lanterns floating around him, but that's like a creature, right? You're just like, oh, that's a ninja dude. With, that's a creature. That's not, that's not a blade rush, I think is what it was called. Or I think it was Hundred Talent Strike is the name of it. It's not a good card. Um, but uh, yeah, the depicting spells is not hard. I think that, uh, I'm sorry, is not easy. I, mm, I, mm. And so now I think that they've really relaxed the the ideas on some, the art style and magic is all over the place now. And not in a bad way necessarily, right? Like the new lands from the upcoming Kamigami Neon Dynasty are about to be my favorite lands. Oh, I mean, they are stunning. That's stunning, you know. And, and you know, we've we've seen the rise of like uh, various generations of artists as well, you know. Um, but it is interesting how, yes, yeah, some of my favorite, I mean, my favorite artist from Magic is also one of the originals, Anson Maddox. And again, Sansin like, Maddox, is that Sengir Vampire? Yep, Sengir Vampire, uh, Animate Dead, I think was his first card that just like really stood out to me. But one of the reasons I love him is that I feel like he was one of the original artists to capture just how dark and nasty the world of magic was, right? And you'd look at like, he also did, uh, what was it, Wall of Flesh? What was that regenerating artifact wall? Um, uh, wall of Putrid Flesh? Oh, man, I've, I'm I'm actually looking at a list here, but he has illustrated literally so many cards. Here we go. Uh, living Wall. Oh, living it was wall? like the wall. It had like teeth in it and like a fetus and stuff. And it was just like you don't you don't see very much of that in Magic anymore, right? And and one of the things that I loved was that you know I came to the game. I was in fourth grade. You know, and here I was like this kind of dorky kid in fourth grade. I liked reading fantasy. I was just kind of, I don't know, I was reading Redwall or whatever, you know, you read in fourth grade. And I saw this game and I was just like, wow, this game is so adult, right? To me at the time, it felt like so grown up and so dangerous. And you, it was, you know what I mean? Do you know the original pitch for Magic? Do you know what it was supposed to be? No. So it was me. supposed to be a game that Dr. Garfield his original vision was people would play it in between sessions of D and D. Ah, uh, okay. Right. So, yep. and it's funny. That's how I got introduced to magic. I was at a, a Dungeons and Dragons competition. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, like a, like our library system where I grew up had like these, like they would have a, I don't know, people would come in and, and then play like competitive D and D against each other, like fame missions or whatever. And two of the DMS from that, system we're playing this game and i'm like what's that and i think that the first card i perceive remembering was maybe a, a circle of protection and blue in play mm. so, so uh we went out and we bought magic packs the next day and i my friend group i was like let's buy spell jammer that is the official tsr one who knows what this wizards of the coast thing is but i was outvoted oh wow. i was outvoted by my friends so uh we <laughs> magic it was it was a fateful moment. You could have you could have veered way off the timeline. <laughs> and who knows, maybe you would have ended up being a professional comic artist or something. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it would have been a different destiny for sure. So, okay, so I while we're on this topic of old meets new, and I know that you had told me, you know, before this conversation that you perhaps didn't have a lot to say about this, but I really do genuinely want to get your take, you know, as someone who's been there since the beginning, and I feel like there are, th these are the perspectives I'm most interested in, right? Because you've had the most time to see the game evolve through its different phases. And so I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about alchemy and how do you feel about magic kind of boldly stepping into this digital only world for the first time? I, I'm going to say like a very on arena craft pod answer, probably. Oh, the, lay it on uh, us, man. We're here for it. 
I consider Magic the Gathering Arena to be a Magic adjacent product, mm. not a Magic product, right? Fat. So um, I enjoy it. I think that it's fun to play. Uh, that I mean, and certainly in, in recent months, right? Like, um, I like like clockwork mythic three months in a row, you know, and it was, wasn't hard. And I was just like, Oh, this is, I mean, it, it was really enjoying it. I was really dialed in. It, it, there was a point actually there where I was just like, if I, if there were pro tours going right now, I'd be killing it. Right. I feel like really prepared, but I, I did that preparation on things like best of one limited, like a lot of best of one constructed, mm-hmm. a lot of the precepts of what I always like, you know, held as being the truisms of tournament magic, don't apply in arena or vice versa. Uh, so uh, I think that you get a lot of transferable skill. If you're, if your goal, my goal, I think if you had to write down what I care about in magic was to be a good tournament magic player, you get some of those skills, but they're transferable skills and arena. I respect arena, but it's its own thing. Mm. So I don't see alchemy as a, uh, any kind of an infringement on magic because I don't consider arena magic. I consider arena like magic's near cousin that I also <laughs> like, right? You know, I like both dark chocolate and milk chocolate. They are both things that I like, but they are different things. Right? So, so, and so just to clarify, and so you had this feeling about arena even before alchemy was introduced. Yeah. yeah. Arena is not magic. And I think that people criticize things, right? And they're like, best of one isn't real. People say things like, mm. Best of one isn't real, man. Best of one isn't competitive, right? They, mm. they say, you know, whatever people say about this kind of stuff. Like, I had a conversation, a half argument with someone on Twitter a few weeks ago about the hand smoother. Like, who cares? Both players get the hand smoother. Mm. Right? It, it all evens out. I mean, CGB has a thought process, which is that if you're good, good in quotes, you get to go first and best of one less often. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, right? I think that the matchmaker is weird. And that is weird, right? Okay, I'm glad to have you on record for that because that's my main conspiracy theory is that the matchmaker is Jack. It's weird. Like yeah. I don't know. Like I I have made deck recommendations on people because the matchmaker, you know, like yeah. If I like make mythic relatively relatively easy playing like kind of a deadly dispute lolf deck and then just crush every event that i'm playing with like mono black fell stinger i'm gonna have a certain idea which i did by the mm. way right i'm gonna have a certain idea about what the best decks and standard are right mm. and then you walk into like you know the arena open or something and then you you play against three blue red decks in a row well i didn't happen to play against those in 75 percent of my matches right like it's just ah. Oh! another mono green deck right like yeah it's yeah so that is it's not it's it's super impossible to say we don't have the underlying data set to say whether the matchmaker was weird or not but i can tell you my matchups are way more annoying when i play blue red dragons than they are when i play other color combinations right like i i don't well, and what what you're highlighting, right? You're highlighting the fact that we've stepped out of what you would consider to be like a traditional magic and into like a walled garden curated experience, right? I, I read something which I think uh, who said it? Uh, I think Drew Levin said it um, last week, which is that I'm going to translate this because I think he was talking about two different games, but like magic adjacent sort of things. I think one experience is like, if you want people to be really good at this, like then you're going to reward skill, right? If you want somebody to play a lot of arena, you're going to reward time spent, Mm. right? And rewarding skill and time spent are two different things and it's okay to reward time spent. So if I, if I went back and I said, I said like, you know, all the things I said to people are like, hand smoother, stupid, Best of one is it magic? I would just be like, yeah, sure. I agree. So what? There's more people enjoying magic now than there ever have been before. Mm. And if you're so confident that these things that they're learning are so bad, then when tournaments open up again, you should just crush all these noobs that come in. It doesn't, there's no skin off your back. What's the problem? You know, like I think Arena just, I, I, I spent decades grinding Moto. I'd much rather play Arena than Moto. And mm. I had a God account. Right. Mm. <laughs> All right. So 
Um, it, so, so, and, and so why is that? Is it the convenience? Is it like, what, what is it about arena that, that gets you? I think that arena is, a, this is a weird thing to say. Like I made a point to make F and M almost every week from the dungeons. I started in the dungeons and dragons pre-release, which is like, you know, in July or something end of June, whenever that was up until about Thanksgiving. And I, this attendance has been poor since the holidays, right? So on a Friday night. And I, I did it because I cared about playing paper magic, but I mean, a lot of the time I'd go play like four hours commitment of midnight hunt paper draft, which I went, you know, when I had a mode expectation of two and one, right? I think I won, I think I three and owed one midnight hunt, uh, F and M at a pretty casual F and M. And I was without a doubt, one of the best midnight hunt players on arena, right? There's no question, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I was like mythic top 100 in the first week, uh, in, in, uh, in, um, in November. Right. So it was like, is, which is like weird, right? So it's just like, okay, I could, these guys don't know how to play magic and they're kicking my butt one out of three matches. And I would literally like play my four hours worth of, uh, of paper F and M and then go home and play like two drafts before I went to bed. Right. Like, so maybe I was just super jacked on magic at the time. <laughs> I don't, it's, it's so low stress, man. Yeah. Like in, in other contexts, I can tell you, I talked to this, some of my friends not that long ago. I have vivid recollections of tournament losses from tournaments that don't matter, like random PTQs 15 years ago. I can remember like some minor mistake I made to not top eight or like, oh, shoot, like I did this or I got mana screwed in this round to not top. Like I had a string where like I lost the win and into like five straight Star City, Star City opens or something, right? So like always lost the win and in yeah. and i it was never for a good reason like i, I was mana screwed on camera i think almost every single time it was, it was horrible right so I, I can remember all those things but like when i lose on arena it's just like i'm just gonna play three more games in the next 10 minutes Flip it. right like yeah it just washes it out right and yeah. and it just takes away all of the thing that i didn't like right mm. so i i don't know like there's no joy in paper magic without losing, right? Because if you win all the time, that's that's not joyful, right? But I'm telling you, like, if you care to the level that I clearly cared at one point in my life, right? You get, you remember these things forever. But I, my wife would tell me I was woefully unhappy coming back from long tournaments far more often than I was hmm. happy coming back from hmm. from uh, from long tournaments. And I just, I mean, I don't know. I shout at the screen sometimes, right? Like. I hate it when they top deck like the third epiphany. <laughs> that sucks, <laughs> oh, right? Like, like I've, yeah. I've been playing so, you know, I played with my back against the wall. I'm playing so well. They're like, ah, oh, top deck the last epiphany. Yeah, I hate that. You know, and half the time I made a mistake. It was a minor mistake. And maybe I could have eked one point in earlier. And maybe I get better because of that. But I can yeah. tell you, I've probably lost hundreds of arena games. I don't know. I've played thousands of arena games. I must have lost hundreds, you know. Uh, and it, Almost no arena losses. Almost no arena losses. Do I remember like, at all? They don't haunt you. Yeah. But there are so many times that I wish that I were, you know, kind of a, a CGB style magic content creator because the games that I play, I'm like, this would have been such a great game to comment. Mm. This would be such a, this is such a great teachable moment. How I did this or what my opponent did here is so interesting. This should have been, commem mm. and it wasn't commemorated because I just play with myself uh, on arena. And I, those joyful moments far outweigh, you know, the stressful moments of losing or getting top deck, even though it happens every day. Like, I just don't, I literally, like, if I don't, if I don't, like, seven win an event, right, I'm kind of annoyed. Sometimes I don't four win an event, right? And I don't care. And I just go pay my golds, and then I seven win the next event, right? And it's okay. I think, I don't know. Um, the downside on Arena is so nothing. It's just nothing. Yeah. The upside, I like it a lot. That does that answer your question? Well, I just I, I think what I love is that to me it sounds like it has helped you, Michael Flores, like at various points 
highly competitive magic player, highly invested, you know, pro level magic player. It sounds like it has helped you to rediscover some of that just love of the game, right? Some of that just like, I just love jamming games of magic. I just love getting in there and, and just seeing what happens, right? So, well, with the way the world is, right, I wouldn't have played magic for two years if there was an arena, right? Like <laughs> instead, a good I played at a super high level. Right? So yeah. I'm like, I, that was. That was cool. I like that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I love it has its own. I love it has its own economy. I mm. and I, uh, Arjuna, explain this to me. Yeah, I don't understand people complaining about the arena economy. Well, I okay. don't understand it. Let's get into that because that's been a hot topic lately, and I'm sure a lot of people watching and listening to this are going to be very interested to hear you talk about it. But it sounds like you're a little bit more on the like Arjuna CGB side of it. Of, a, no. like, uh, so is it because you draft a lot? Is that why the economy doesn't? Okay, so first of all, I've evolved, right? Yeah. So I've evolved as a player, right? Uh, out of an arena player, I should say, which yeah. I guess means I've evolved as a magic player or a player in general. But I have, I, I even, the last time I was on your show, I was just like laughing, like, I blew a bunch of mythics on like Ellie Wick Tumblestrum because <laughs> of a CGB video. I did that. I mean, uh, I, I blew a bunch of mythics on like for it. half of a white weenie deck and I didn't even get the good ones, right? I could just yeah. screwed up. But like, so what? I, I, You know how much money I've spent on Arena? How many dollars I've spent on Arena? Can you guess? I'm guessing it's like somewhere in the hundreds. It's zero dollars. Zero dollars. I have spent zero dollars wow. on Arena. I am mythic every single month if I care. Wow. Right? So. Love it. So. And I don't, and I, I don't get it, right? Like people comment on how many gems I don't have, and I'm like, yeah, because I spend my gems to play the next draft, right? Like so, it, like if you understand like the basic economy, you're like, if you're a break even or better player in limited, you just have a limitless collection, right? Like, and it's not hard to be a break even or better player in limited, I think, right? And if you're not that, right? So I didn't. I so since about Thanksgiving or before then, I had like a lot of family commitments like the last month or so. I've been, I don't think I played a single ranked game of of limited in December. But I should play one so that I just claim my packs or whatever for having a status before the month is up in the next two days. Right. So I should do that. But like, um, but I just I didn't have the time for that. I'm doing other things. Um, you know, I'll probably be a serious drafter again, semi serious drafter again sometime in the near future. But I haven't. But like, ever since the scales came off my eyes about standard events. I mean, like, how is everyone just not infinite? Like, you have to be pretty bad to not have a four and a half win expectation in a standard event, right? Like, it's, it's, that's like I barely mean, higher than 50, uh, barely percent, barely higher than like 55% win rate or something. It's like, it's not. I mean, I, I, I think that maybe there's a little bit of being one of the best magic players in the world privilege going on here. <laughs> because, dude. I mean, I know it seems simple to you, right? But I think that, like, so think about the people who maybe they've just come to the game in the last couple of months, right? Or maybe, you know what I mean? And, and, and here's something that I think about a lot, because I'm totally with you, and CGB is with you, and I think a lot of content creators are with you in that the economy doesn't seem overly punishing to us, to, uh, to the people who are very invested. And I think one of the reasons for that, there was a couple of reasons for that. Number one is that we've probably just played the client enough that we've figured out how to make it work for us, right? So that's, that's one thing that I think you're highlighting. But the other thing is that we're just used to a world in which magic cards cost hundreds or thousands of dollars. Oh, I if mean... you want, I could talk <laughs> about paper magic economy. So, here, so here's the thing, yeah. okay? I I think I just have like a dip. This is going to sound so silly to you, right? Mm. I thought you at one point, I thought you could only wild card cards that you owned, right? That's an easy mistake to make right? because so, Arena is annoyingly designed. Yes, indeed. So the first time I got a Goblin Chain Whirler in like a opening a pack or whatever. And I was mm. so ter I was like, every time I got a thousand gold, I would open packs, right? I didn't mm. know that I was supposed, at that point, I didn't know I was supposed to stockpile my gold so that I could develop limited skills, right? Mm. So 
Um, and I just didn't know, right? So I, the first time I got a Goblin Chain Whirler, I'm like, y'all, the world is about to change because then I immediately wild carded the rest of the Goblin Chain Whirlers from my deck and it was on. Right? <laughs> so I was like playing, like I probably had rare wild cards. I don't remember. It's just, you know, three years ago, you know, early on in Arena. I just didn't know that I could do that, right? I would have had a way better deck. And the, the the thing is, like, I was playing, like, whatever five casting cost, like, common haste dinosaur oh, there was God, in red. Because, like, yeah. those, were, I, those were the cards that those I had to had. begin with. Love it. So, so, and, you know, I wasn't good, but I was, like, winning enough to get gold to open packs to eventually open one Goblin Chain Whirler, right? So, but the thing is, if people have, anybody who's listening to this podcast, right? I think as a level of investment, which I think they can translate to this. Pick a deck that you like, all right? Hopefully it's a monocolored deck because the the punishing thing in the arena economy is dual lands. Oh, God. Yeah, that's all all of your rare wild cards just gone, right? Well, no. If you draft enough, you get all the, all the dual lands. That's true. But, yeah. but, um, but if you don't draft enough, you don't get all the dual lands. So pick a good monocolored deck, right? Luckily, right now, there's at least two, and I would actually argue Mono Red is a really good deck that just nobody plays, right? Well, um, I mean, in Alchemy, it's a so very I, competitive I, I deck right so now. Put put Alchemy aside. I don't have an informed opinion on Alchemy. You asked, so, you know, I was just like, Arjuna, what should we talk about? You're like, what's your opinion on Alchemy? My opinion is I played the midweek event to get the free cards, and then I never <laughs> played it again, right? So uh, I just, I don't have the bandwidth to play Alchemy and everything else, right? My experience with Alchemy is I think I've watched, like, two CGB videos and like mm. one other random content creator videos. And it seemed, well, it, it seemed ridiculous to me and no, but yeah, not in a bad way. I'm like, let's, all right, let's get the, the hot circus take, is fun too. Right? So, so let's get the hot take from you. Cause I, I do want to get just at least a little perspective. So as someone who hasn't played it much, as someone who views arena as just already a secondary magic product, I mean, I don't think it's it, it could be the primary magic product. It's just magic adjacent. OK, magic adjacent. Got it. Got it. So so the question I have is, do you do you like that as a direction? Do you like the fact that they're trying something new and making a potentially like a forking of the magic card pool? I like anything that makes people spend money on magic. Mm. I like that. Right. Mm. That is sustainable. Right. I think some of the decisions they made in the past were not sustainable. Mm. Right. So I like that. Um, I like that this is not economically damning. Uh, I dislike the fact that my gold span dragons don't seem to translate. Right. Like that's weird. Right. Like why do I have to have the crappy version of gold span dragon as well as the right, like, you know, how about an alchemy? I just get to have the regular or crappy version of gold span dragon if that's the appropriate one. That I don't like. But it doesn't that that may, that's a turnoff. I don't. That's one of the reasons I didn't play alchemy, right? I well, own the correct version of the card. I have to have the crappy version of the card to play it in alchemy. Well, you you get both, right? So that is taken care of. But are you just talking about how you just don't like making the Whoa. mental transition? This is news to me, man. You know how like you're like arena kind of set up weird. I didn't realize that. I tried to make a deck with it, and it like X'd out my guy. So I assumed oh, no. I couldn't play it. So I just never tried. Oh. So now you are blowing my mind. Oh, Michael. Okay. That so is that is not my fault. No, that's not your fault. That's a stupid arena design fault. So this was a launch issue. It might still be an issue. But I never where... tried again because I was so turned off from that. Well, that would be a tilt, right? So no, what you needed to do, which no one told you you needed to do, <laughs> is all you needed to do is just remove them all from the deck and re-add them, and it would add the right ones in. That but, is, This but, is like when I got my first Goblin Chain Whirler. <laughs> <laughs> the world changed. I think the thing that I hate is that you have to like you have to be in a subreddit to know that, or you have to be talking to your buddy Arjuna to know that. You you know the that client's not crazy. telling you that, right? Okay, this is this is crazy to me, right? Yeah. Like, I'm like a mythic tier player, yeah, who's been playing Magic the Gathering since 1994, and I can't figure that out from launch. Like, that's oh man, it's that I is. Mean, 
It's embarrassing, right? Woo! It's embarrassing. And I and I think it's just, you know, it adds fuel to the fire. These people throwing the coal on the fire of, of you know, Wizards is terrible at making a digital offering. And, you know, I think some of those criticisms are, are legitimately leveled, for sure. Um, but I, but so I let actually... Let me talk to you about a bad economy for a second. I, yeah. I've never talked about this publicly. This is the thing that happened. Me and a bunch of my friends are at John Finkel's house one night. And... One of them, I think Landy Ho is like, should I buy this card? Oko Thief of Crowns. Oh, man. So we're at we're at, we're <laughs> at his house and we know a ban is coming up the next week. OK, so BDM doesn't buy any Okos. While we're at John's house. I think Land gets his four Okos for a variety of prices from like twenty four dollars to like forty dollars. Right. Mm. I go home and I buy my Okos on credit as soon as I get home. I live 20 minutes walk from John's house. I buy all of my Okos at the same price for about $44. There's like a $20 variance in the 20 minutes from John's house to get back. The band, so the bands happen. The band that happens on Field of the Dead, not on Oko. So Oko now spikes to even higher, mm. right? So think about this for a second. If you were going to play competitive constructed during this window of magic, you kind of had to own Oko Thief of Crowns. Right. Oh, like far off. you Easy. basically had to own it. Right. Yeah. So I owned it. So I'm a genius. I own, I bought it for like 40 odd dollars. Right. And it, anybody who wanted to play during this era basically had to pay the piper for this card. Cause there's opening enough packs of throne of Eldraine to get the Okos is that's a joke. That's worse. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's what happens a month later. What's the value of Oko? <laughs> Five dollars, ten dollars. I don't know, but <laughs> you could at least play it in modern at one point because I played yeah. it in modern that that November. But you can't play it anywhere. There's no format you can play it. It, it, it maybe yeah, like, like, formats I don't play like vintage I think or it's, something. It's still playable in Commander it's, and a one-off it, in vintage. It yeah. literally won the Vintage World Championship that year, right? <laughs> yep. Which is a ridiculous <laughs> statement to make. But yeah. this is a card that, like, it literally spiked in value by twenty dollars on the way, literally on my walk home. Yeah, my other friend just didn't buy any because he thought it might get banned that week. Right? He was wrong, so it went up in value. And and then everybody had to own it, and then it plummeted in value. I think that is extraordinarily bad, mm. and that like, if there's anything mm. turning people off of Magic, it's that. There was so much leverage on certain cards that you ha kind of had to own. The secondary market value of those cards is like so out of whack for an imprint card. Yeah. And then if I say arbitrary, maybe it is data driven from the perspective of the nice people in Renton, Washington, but it's arbitrary from the perspective of the market, right? Mm. Arbitrary bannings of cards destroy the secondary market. You could not do this in the stock market. You could not do this in a controlled <laughs> no. securities environment. No. And they're not really any different, right? There are yeah. whole businesses built on speculating magic cards, right? I think that is a a very serious flaw in in magic economy. So I'll, mm. I'll tell you another thing. I, I don't know if you saw this. I, I did a lot of posting on Twitter, I think in the month of November on this, where I sorted through my entire 20 close to 30 year magic collection in November and like reorganized and everything. And I posted a bunch of stuff. Like there's a lot of un forgotten treasures or whatever. Right. So among other things, I found four beta mana vaults that, Ooh. or, you know, so I joked, I was just like, if I find a single revised mana vault, I'll sell all these. Right. Mm. And so of course I found like, seven fourth edition mana vaults or whatever so am i now morally bound to sell the the beta mana vaults i don't know man i mean i definitely should sell like i have surplus gaia's cradles right like it's crazy to own these things right like to own more than four gaia's cradles including i own judge promo gaia's cradles stuff like that like it i think like it's really weird like when i talk to old school players they're like, no one has ever been happy selling a restricted list card, mm. right? Like, and he's just like, yeah, 
the the paper value on those mana vaults is extraordinarily high, right? It's I don't know twenty thousand dollars or something. It's like, um, but it's just gonna go up. <laughs> you can't sell. Yeah. There's no now, now there's no the time. There's no peak. No right. So no. like I don't I don't I mean I think selling like surplus guys cradles is a different question than this. Like but. I, I don't know. I remember I had so many wastelands. They were like fifty five dollars, and they've been reprinted like four times since. Like that's the, that stuff is maddening to me. Yeah, you know, like, and I've never, I've never sold like a magic card really. Well, and, and I mean, so that's what fascinates me about magic is that in addition to being a game, it's it's an economy, right? And there are some like I have friends who literally, they spend more time thinking about the value of their magic cards than they do about what deck they're gonna put them in, right? And and I think that, that, it, that for some people it's a creep, right? It happens over the years. Like they started out a passionate player and over the years, the finance aspects of magic, it's like it's sunk its teeth into them, right? Yeah, and now they just, they can't shake it, man. They can't let it go. It's weird, like so much of like the, like the fortune of my magic collection is just in wastelands and force of wills that I bought for 50 cents, like in 1998 or whatever. Right. So I just have a ton, yeah. but like, you know, they, have, they obviously are tremendous value relative to that. Uh, but I never thought about the, how much it costs to make decks really. Mm. But like, for most of my era. So like I said, like probably 75% of my uh, 50% of my life as a tournament player, I just drafted well enough to just have every deck I needed to play. Mm. Um, then I borrowed cards for a while. And then I figured out that you could turn articles or whatever into, <laughs> into store credit. So <laughs> that's where I got, that's where I got my, my decks for the last couple of years. Um, but it, I don't know. It, it's foreign to me that this is like a prohibitive thing, except when I sit down at F and M and there's like a 12 year old kid sitting across from me was a thousand dollars in front of him right mm. every single time that happens i'm like where did this kid get the money for this like that that is always flabbergasting to me well i mean co i don't know if you've heard this before but covert go blue tells the story about how one of the motivating factors for him to advance his career in life was that he wanted to be able to afford to play magic Right. And oh, that's so, awesome. Well, that yeah. he did it by doing it simultaneously. Well, well, there you go. Right. He did it in the best way possible. But I mean, but I remembered that as well. Like, you know, I like I was not a well off kid growing up. You know, I mean, like I came from a family where like just my parents keeping clothes on my back was enough of an expense. Right. So I really didn't I didn't have a lot of pocket money to spend on a premium product like Magic. And I remember being, you know, like every card that I acquired was a big deal, you know? It's like you'd get some rare that you really wanted. It was a big deal. Oh, you know? yeah. You, I mean, you'd spend a long time thinking about that. You know, you'd, you'd spend time strategizing how you were going to get the next cards that you wanted or needed, right? And so... Um, yeah, it's so it's it, so it's funny for me, you know, to have that in my childhood and then to even in my adulthood just be like, all right, you know, I got to kind of keep an eye on my spending on IRL magic. It's something I actually have to consider a budget for, right? And then so for me to go from that to going on arena and f literally feeling, I mean, for me, I feel like I just I just click a button and I've got the card. Yeah. And it's uh it's it's so for me it's a total paradigm shift in the value of the cards. And and so I also sometimes can have a little bit of a hard time relating to people who feel like they're getting squeezed so hard, right? So for me, like every time I look at like my bill from cool stuff or whatever, wherever I'm ordering cards from, and I'm like a plus EV magic player, right? Like so more is coming back to me than I'm putting into it, you know, from a financial standpoint. Uh, like every time I have to make a deck for like an eternal format or, you know, even some standard decks, or whatever, the bill could be pretty substantial. You kind of shake your, shake your head at that. Mm. Like I have so many surplus sacred foundries that have never seen the inside of a sleeve, for example. Right. Mm. So, and I, and I, I, you know, I, I do shake my, like, I'm like, what's up with this? That's why I'm just flabbergasted at FNM when I see like these kids who have a thousand dollars in front of them. I just don't get it. Like when people are complaining about the arena economy, if your if your account gets hacked and somebody steals your password, they can't even screw you. 
right? Like, like what can they do? Open your wild cards, right? Like, you, <laughs> like if people get their Moto account stolen, that's like a that's like a yeah. house mortgage sometimes, right? Yeah. What yeah. can they do to you when they get your arena account? You're gonna get it recovered. That's a good point. Oh like, no, and, they signed oh, they me up for all these drafts. Oh, <laughs> oh no, right? Like, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> like, it's not the same thing. Yeah. And so, what I was saying before is like, pick a deck, pick a one color deck for now. Get good at that deck. Earn enough gold that you can that you can draft. Get good enough at draft that you just like. You don't have to be. You don't have to be the ham, okay? You don't have to be the ham. You just have to you just have to draft well enough to sustain your drafting habit. And if you can sustain your drafting habit, which is not that hard, right? It's people are like, oh, you you have this kind of privilege. Yeah, maybe. Like I do have a, a years of experience to draw on, but every draft format is new and different. And I'm good at some and I'm less good at other ones, right? But get to that level and you will be an infinite arena player. Right. Like it's I, I have taken like months and months of never even logging into arena before. Right. And I come back and I've been able to reestablish it using these principles. It's mm. this economy sustains for you, but they give you free gold just for playing games every day. Right. Yeah, and that's I mean, I mean, I you know, I'm I'm with you as someone who uh, the last time I spent money on arena was 2019. And um, and I've gone infinite, not even drafting every set. There were just a handful of sets that I went really deep on, and that basically just established my complete billfold moving forward, right? Um, so I'm totally with you. And I, I think that where it really starts to grind on people is for the people who don't want to have to do that, right? And they're looking across the, uh, the aisle at like Rune Terra or some of these other games, and you know, and they're seeing these like abundant payout systems. I do. I did want to well, highlight. Free to play games work one of two ways. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. They're free to play. If they're free to play, that means that you're the product, right? Yeah. We represent the play experience of other players. Okay. You can get everything you want, Magic the Gathering Arena, if you're willing to put time in. And if you're not willing to put time in, then you put money in. Mm. That's your yep. choice. But if you said, yeah. okay. I want to put neither time nor money in. We couldn't have cared very much, right? Like, like, I would also like to win the lottery and get the attention of supermodels every day. That would be a great life, I think, for me if I was winning the lottery every day. And I was, I, I was going to say like Linda Evangelista, which tells you about how much I know about supermodels of the, of, you know, the last two decades. Uh, but like, you know, that would be great if every time I walked down the street. Um, you know, I, I, I was just inundated with, with the attention of, uh, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. But like, not really, right. That's not anybody's real reality. Well, and so, um, there was a, a really great, uh, Twitter thread that was made and I wish I can remember the name of this person, pretty well-known, uh, voice in the gaming community. And I, I'm just, I'm blanking on it at the moment. Um, but it was a basically a Twitter, and I retweeted it, so you can find it on my Twitter if you want. Uh, this guy was basically comparing the economy of Arena to like other free-to-play TCGs. And was it Drew Levin? I yes, it was, Drew Levin. It, it was Drew Levin. So did you read that Twitter thread? Yeah. So the thing that I said earlier that I was describing to Drew is a translation of that. I think into yeah. It's a arena economy. That, so and so and what Drew highlighted was that he was saying that you have to examine what the product is, and he was saying that on arena the product is the cards, right? The whole goal of arena is to sell you cards. The whole goal of a platform like Rune Terra or some of these other games is to get you invested enough in the game that you want to buy like all of the. Um, why am I blanking on the name of them? Like the the frills, right? The like the aesthetics stuff, or whatever. The aesthetic upgrades, yeah, so right? I look and, at I look at the bills that I get. You can I look at whatever Apple charges that I have because I yeah. have like the master Apple account. Or like yeah. my wife pays money for like premiums in Words with Friends. <laughs> like, I don't know <laughs> how go. much money my son <laughs> has put into virtual virtual currency to play. Like like I, I it was. 
flabbergasting to me. I'm like, how much did we spend for this? Like, I, what is it? Like an Xbox? Is that the name of it? Mm. This Xbox. And then the game costs this much money. But you put way more money into the virtual currency to continue playing the game. I already paid yeah. money for the game. Yeah. Right? He's just like, no, nah, I need contracts for my players. Right. And he's just like constantly op- opening packs. He like opened like the rarest Steph Curry this week and then sold it for like three million virtual currency or something. Nice. I'm like, how long is that going to sustain you? He's like, I already blew it all in other players, right? <laughs> like, he's like, I only came off with like 1.5 million. Like I got like a worse Curry, but he's not oh, that much worse. And then like, anyway, so like people are are that's not even a free to play game, right? So like, uh, Words with Friends is like a free to play game, and she's just paying money to play free to play games, and my son is paying money into these. It's just you just pay money to play games, man. Like that's just that's just the stakes. Like people have to make you know. Here's a question, all right? Mm. All right so if any of their parents out there with children of a certain age, I can recommend a thing. I have been playing The Last of Us and The Last of Us 2 with my daughter. She has a PS5, right? So she just plays The Last of Us and then we like kind of narrate it together. And my wife makes fun of me. She's just like, here's like a nerd playing a video game and here's a different nerd watching that nerd play the video game. And I'm like, no, we are embarking on a narrative experience together. Like this is, it's not that different from watching a movie, except for it's like more, it's you're more directly invested. I don't understand how that game makes any money. That game costs a hundred million dollars to make. A <laughs> hundred million dollars. <laughs> wow. They sold yeah. like a hundred and sixty million dollars worth of units or something. That does not pay a hundred million dollar bill, right? They won yeah. eighty Game of the Year awards, but I think they're in the hole by like forty million dollars on this. I don't understand that model. That one. You tell me, man. Arjuna, do you know about video game economics? Because uh, I don't know how that no, works. No, I'm not. I'm not big up on that, man. I, uh, I'm just steeped. Well, and and I mean that's why people are going to these like pay to play models, right? Free free to play, pay to play, because because it scales. There's no limit, right? There's no I limit paid on the amount. Nineteen dollars for The Last of Us Two. <laughs> <laughs> it costs a hundred million dollars to it's yeah. it's good do you yeah. play these kind of games man that game is good it's very <laughs> violent very violent the, the uh the power just went off in my room which is hilarious so so people are gonna get to see knight arjuna for the well, they have for, knight michael j the whole time they, yeah right i'm i'm joining in make the, in the ambience the, and maybe um, like going a little more. <laughs> so, and actually, this is this is kind of a good transition because um, I mean, I could talk to you all evening, Michael J. But you know, there's only so long that uh, people are going to sit down and and listen to this. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, I wasn't interesting enough to keep the audience oh, engaged. Oh, hey man, it's uh, it's always a fight to get this show ending on time, right? Because, I mean, if there's one thing that, that CGB and I and pretty much everyone agrees on who comes on this show, it's that it's fun to talk about magic, right? So, um, but one of the questions that I have for us just going out here before we hit the road is, like, um, you know, you've you've played magic competitively for decades, like literally decades. And, um, you know, I know that you're maybe not, necessarily at a phase where you're feeling like you're full of fire to like you know oh no man let me tell you something your hat in the ring i am i am literally grinding with the teenagers again so they're like common and we're we are prepping for so you know this i think right so my apprentice roman fusco and roman's apprentice itai kurtzman both top aided in las vegas so itai has like a parallel like uh, a parallel friend called Patrick and they they share a collection or whatever and they're like so we're like all in on the next event and we are IRL practicing for the old school pre-modern event in Boston coming up in May and I have not had this much fun in years oh my god nice paper man. magic it it's it's cra- it, oh, yeah I don't know I just talked to all my friends like so half of them are like really good pro players from like 10, 15 years ago who like, they're not like current pro players, but we all remember how the cards worked back then. We're all like, these decks could all be so much better. <laughs> mm. <laughs> when you look at like the tournament performances, it's so fun. 
pre-modern. It's the most unarena thing I could be talking about that was still magic. <laughs> no, it seems like such a sweet format. I definitely, you know, one of my favorite content creators is Andrea Mangucci. And, um, Me too! And I mean, the guy just loves magic, right? And, you know, so I've been watching his progress into the pre-modern format. And I, it, I love mangu so much like i'd say like he's my second favorite youtuber okay my first favorite youtuber is katie sackoff no offense <laughs> i i'm <laughs> right, so not even aware of this person katie sackoff played starbuck on um on uh battlestar galactica ah, the reimagined okay. battlestar galactica she's a a woman so not, right? not a not a magic content creator so yeah so okay she's not the guy who played face on uh the a team because he was the guy who played starbuck in the original battle star collective but she was like in her early 20s when she played starbuck and that, that it's like 20 years have gone by and she's but she's worked constantly since mm. and she's a really interesting person she's like she's very i mean this is 2021 so take what i'm saying with a grain of salt right she's an attractive blonde actress but her body has changed over the course of like the last 20 years. And she's played a, a, like a lot of her YouTube content is about like, this is how much I weighed when I played this character. This is how mm. I trained to play this character. She often plays like mm. female action hero type roles, but she builds her, she builds her body to play them in very different ways. And I find, and, and she's also like a competitive Spartan racer and stuff like that. So I think, so like, oh, she sounds like a badass. Yeah, she like peels back. She's like literally weighs more than me playing this role that she some role she played with Vin Diesel. And I'm like, she weighs more than me. And like, um, which is that's not a profile for, you know, you think of as an attractive blonde Hollywood actress. Or she's just like, I was playing opposite Vin Diesel. So I thought my body should have more mass. So she just like. I'm not sure she wasn't like wearing revealing clothes or whatever in that role. So she's like, I'm not sure if she just got fat or if she just put a lot of bulk on with muscle or whatever. But then she's just like, then I got, and then she's just like, she played this one role on a show called Longmire, which is on um, Netflix for a long time. And she's just like, the main thing about this role is I had to have a really good butt because like the director always shot my, shot me from behind. So I trained this way. And it's just like she's just totally like peeling back, and she does like all like the crazy things that you do to be a health nut slash actually fit person who is now probably approaching her forties, but she came into the public eye when she was in her twenties, and she's never stopped playing action badasses, and she hmm. so she does like cryo freezing and every kind of like goobery thing that you it's. Just a, just, she has cheat day and she just eats all this chocolate and candy from different countries and it's and I, anyway my favorite youtuber is katie sackoff my second favorite youtuber is cover go blue but i love mengu i'd say he's my third favorite and the reason i love him is he's just like talking magic in whatever accent you know he's he's got his italian accent and then like whenever something bad happens he just starts swearing he's in italian swearing oh up man storm. yeah i love it so much all all of the italian swear words i know i've learned directly from mangu so yeah it's yeah, perfect so. um so but this is what i wanted to ask you right was you know we're coming into the year 2022 and i think something that's on a lot of people's minds is just organized play Right. And we, we can't go deep on this, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. You know, uh, William Huey Jensen just announced. My very good friend, baby Huey. There you just go. Just announced yesterday that he's taking a, a role. Um, so here's my thought. Pro Magic, etc. The Hall of Fame, stuff like that. It was always kind of a dice roll, coin flip, whatever you wanted to call it, in the hollowed halls of Watsi about whether or not it ever made them any money. Mm -hmm. Right? So Magic Gathering Pro Tour was originally a marketing expense when it came out in the mid-90s. They are like, we're going to spend a million dollars, right? That was the purse or whatever. We're going to create competitive interest. I think that was... I assume it was successful. I mean, that... I don't... I think if there had been no Pro Tour back then, I would have never gotten invested in Magic more than it was. All right? So... Uh, you know, I was playing group game table magic in whatever the cafe at my school on Thursday nights, but it, nothing like the level of plates. Uh, we transformed from playing goobery group games on Thursday nights to like a culture of play test sessions multiple times a week mm. to try to get on the pro tour. Right. Mm. And then 
Um, and I, you know, mileage varied about how good the teams I ever was on once I got on the pro. I mean, I was on the best team in the world multiple times, but uh, that that was a good, kind of a hit or miss thing for me over the course of a twenty odd year career. Um, uh, that was that was I I think an effective thing that they did back then. But with the rise of some of these other things, I think it'd be very difficult to make the argument inside of WOTC. This past two years has been their most successful in terms of revenue generated, largely because of Arena. Mm -hmm. And um, their player base has expanded tremendously, largely because of Arena. They somehow are still supporting Magic Online. I mean, I I have to assume the Magic Online revenues have gone down a lot. Like, when when you... (laughs) You know, people used to compare Magic Online with like League of Legends or whatever. I'm like, well, yeah, I understand League of Legends has X amount of revenue coming in, but every other game that exists would kill for the revenue per user of Magic Online, right? Like, oh, absolutely. people are spending like forty bucks a week in drafts. Well, and the other thing is, I mean, just think about the amount of money it's made over the period of time that it's existed, right? Yeah, so- I mean, it's still got to be a cash cow that most development houses would be happy to have, right? Yeah. So. I, I think like for them to be like, all right, we want to do this thing for OP, do this thing for like the pro players. That is, I, I don't, I think that there's going to be some version of a pro tour. Um, I think there's going to be some version of online coverage. Um, and I think it's going to be exciting and engaging. I think it's not going to be like probably what we saw right before the pandemic. Mm. which was again i think like a weird side so like before there was like retention based pro- programs i think and then what we saw right before the pandemic was like this hybrid that was trying to legitimize magic on uh, magic gathering arena again at the same time as you know tying that with uh uh with pro level magic so i don't think it's going to look like that i mean the they've made it pretty clear that they're not going to support the human beings that they had, you know, created a structure to support uh, prior to that. If it looks like, like, I don't care. Like, if it looks like it looked like the end of the 90s, which was way less money, four Pro Tours a year, handful of Grand Prix that were largely paid for by the tournament organizers themselves, I think that would be great. And I think that in the United States, there would be a, a enormous amount of interest in that. It's not, it's not that expensive for them to run, like a million... I, Call it two million bucks a year, right? One million dollars a year in prize money, and another quarter million to put on four different shows. So it's yeah, probably about I mean, what it costs. It's like how much did they pay Mr. Beast to do his little appearance? Yeah, it's like right? it's literally like I mean that's just next to nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't even pay for articles anymore, right? Like you know the like who has a column right now? Rosewater, like almost nobody else. Yeah. Uh, they, they, so and they, they've transitioned so much to the stream, uh, to the kind of the streaming sort of mm. content creators, and they can like leverage the stuff that they have for a ton of free promotion. Mm. It's it, you're going to have German organizers like a uh, Star City, Channel Fireball, regional promoters who are going to figure out a way to make money on PTQs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be the biggest most lavish thing in the universe for people to be interested i would like there to be a retention based program for serious tournament players but if there's not right i've been, i've had a blast playing magic like the last 6 months and if there's just fnm and I, I i tell this story sometimes i had i had my second child i was like probably playing the best magic of my life at the point that i had my second child then I didn't play in a pro tour for 10 years. I got back on the pro tour, had my best individual finish I ever had. I was on team ultra pro and that stuff was great. And then um, I had a level up in my career for a while. And I was, and I I've always, I've always had this thought over and over again for probably the last 15 years, which was, will I ever play in another pro tour? Right. And I was just like, and um, then the, PTQ system changed to the store-based PTQ system. And I realized quickly that it was just FNM. Like I would literally just be playing against the people who I beat in FNM every week. And I'm like, this is the easiest path to the project ever put in front of me. And so I immediately qualified again, right? So if there's anything like that, you're going to have people who are capable, who are happy to be there. And I, we had 
such a passionate pro tour community when we were all paying our own bills. Right. Like I had to get myself to the pro tour. I had to pay for my own hotel. You know, like I could subsidize it with writing money. I could get a, a sponsorship from somebody. We did. We had no shortage of Kai Boudes and Gabriel Nassif's and Bob Maher's Paulos. and, and yeah. John Finkel's when the world was like that. If they want to return to that world, you are going to have great players playing great magic on camera, promoting your game for you. I promise you that. And of all the people in the world who know that, Huey is one of the people who knows that. Huey yeah. was a, he built his Pro Tour Hall of Fame career in that era. I, I I don't know. I never, like, it was cool. Like, I'd have friends who had, like, a expensive hotel room paid for by Watsy, and I would hang out in it. Like, I would, like, stay in their hotel room instead of paying for my own hotel room, right? That was cool. I mean, I didn't need it. I was just... I, people just joke to me like Brad Nelson or Ari Lax are just like, you're just happy to be here. I'm like, yeah, I'm happy that I'm like 42 or whatever. And I, I'm still good enough to be here. Right. Mm. And I don't need to win every round. I, I mean, like my illusions playing on the pro tour are not that I'm going to win the pro tour. So like, I wanted to be good enough to be here and have a story to tell when I got back. And if I make a few bucks, it's not even going to wash out my travel costs probably. Right. That's not yeah. why you play. Like I, that's not why I ever played, right? Yeah. So, um, but I feel like if you want to do something, this is just how I feel. Not everybody has to feel this way. If you want to do something, it's worth trying to do that thing well. And there's no other way to check if I'm doing it well. You know, mm. I think I don't know. That's what I think. I think that I would be now that I say it out loud. Nobody ever asked this to me before. Give us the late '90s pro tour. Everybody has to pave their own way. Prize money is okay, not spectacular. People who love magic will show up. I mean, it's a modest proposal, right? <laughs> no, no one, no one can call you outlandish for suggesting. It costs them two million dollars like a year. Yeah, local tournament organizers bear most of the costs, yeah. and they wash it out with card sales on site. I think like that is proven to be a sustainable model. They didn't have to put all the money into the system that they did. Right. Um, so. There was certainly a point where they were spend, spending way more money on the architecture of the system and promotion around the system than they were actually giving to the players. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I, I think, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that, is that A of all, um, we do need some kind of a system to motivate people. I would like right? it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think we do. I think that we do. You know, you're always going to have, you know, the the aspirants of the world who want to take it to the next level. And I think it is important to have something for them. But B of all, it doesn't need to cost wizards a lot of money to be something that people will show up for and excited about. And and I agree. I was so stoked to hear when Huey got the job because I was just like, I mean, he's, he's, you know, within whatever wizards allows him to do, I have full faith that he's going to do the best job that he can. So one change I would advocate very strongly for would be to time the set releases, not how they've been the last couple of years, more like they've been previous to that. Yeah. The reason people tuned into the Pro Tour and got excited about the Pro Tour before is they wanted to see what the hell deck New Shada decks. Yasa Oka was going to make. Yes. What did Gabriel Nassif come up with? If yes. the format has already been solved by a million iterations on Magic Online and Magic the Gathering Arena, there's no reason to tune into it, right? Yeah. Like. Like no. the, the average player can't tell the difference between John Finkel and Paulo and Huey or Reed Duke at the table, right? It's just mm. some player who's making a play that they don't understand, mm. right? <laughs> so Yeah, they're playing the same deck I'm playing, just better, yeah. right? No, but they don't even know that it's better. Yeah. Right, like that's that's the <laughs> thing. I, I was like, I, I, I asked somebody once, I'm like, all right, um, there's no question that Ben Stark is better than I am, right? He's mm. better than I am. Does he have a he does he have enough of a better win rate on Magic the Gathering Arena that if an if uh like a just a general population person watched him play and watched me play, they could tell the difference. Mm. And I don't think his win rate is enough higher than mine that they would be able to tell the difference, right? Mm. Mm. That is a fundamental problem, right? Mm. You if you are gonna build a kind of a pro tour, whatever you want to call it, around stars, which is what I think the Pro Tour has always done really well. You have to create some differentiation for the stars. And one of the things that you have to do 
is to unflatten the field, right? Right now, the field is flattened by the deck list being out too early. What I think it's really good for super teams to dominate. I think it's, re- it's like, oh, you're privileged. You're friends with these people. That is true. But I also don't play in every pro tour, right? I think you want to see Reed Duke or Huey or whoever else the name was at the time making multiple pro tour top eights every single year and squashing people once they get there. That is the way that you legitimize the skill aspect of magic. If you have four different events with 32 different players in the top eights, there is no way to say who is good. It's true. It's hard to build a continuous narrative, right? Yeah. Because so, you're just like, yeah, so and so play, yeah, they ground up and this is their first top you eight. And absolutely need to unflatten the information curve. Yeah. That is the that is number one. And it is so much it will increase viewership because people will be excited to watch. Yeah. Um, and so and you need to make it so that. You need to make it so that one of the best players in the world is cranial extractioning for a card that is not in the opponent's deck <laughs> and then doing it again in the next game, even though he was proven to be wrong in the previous game. That is a necessary component of unflattening the, the information curve. So I love it. I uh, love it. We're going to rock and roll in Boston in uh, pre modern in, in old school. It's going to be awesome. You're going to come with some decks that people don't know about yet. And, uh, that's going to be exciting. Reclaim. And some people are going to be like, fire. I wish that I cared about this one. <laughs> You're going to put it on the map for us, Michael. <laughs> Love uh, I it. hope so. <laughs> Love it. Well, um, I think that this is a great place for us to go out on. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to come here and just like span the gamut of topics that we've spoken about tonight. Always a pleasure having you on. Always a ple- pleasure just having your perspective of so many of the different angles that you've come at Magic from over the years. Um, so if people want to follow up with you and keep up with you and follow what you do, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so on Twitter, I'm at 5 with Flores, So uh, that's that's a way. Uh, I write on Cool Stuff Inc. about every week. And if I can plug a podcast to people who listen to Magic the Ironing podcast. Of course. Um, I am currently doing a project called Barbarian Class. Uh, I pair it with my Cool Stuff article every week and a good good amount of the time. Uh, Magic, whatever they call it, Las Vegas top A competitor Roman Fusco joins me. Uh, the aesthetic is very similar to what we used to do uh, on a podcast called Ancestral Recall, which... TGB will tell you is a good podcast. I don't know if you listen to it. <laughs> I, I have not listened to it, but I'm stoked to hear about Barbarian Class. I think I think I maybe just like saw some mention of it in passing on Twitter, but it didn't really register for me. So I'm really glad that you brought it up again because yeah, I'm it's... like like literally when I hit stop on this recording, I'm gonna go and load that up. All right. Please do. And all, all of your listeners. Also loaded up. It's Barbarian Class on Apple Podcasts or wherever get you get your podcasts. Sounds amazing. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much, Michael. Um, wishing you a happy new year and uh, excellent, you know, times with your family. And uh, go go crush it in in pre modern, man. Oh, I will, man. Awesome. Wild Mongrel didn't didn't stop being unbeatable. You know you, you know what you can't beat a Mog fanatic. Oh, Mog fanatic! Did you remember when Mog fanatic was the best one drop of all time? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Woo! Mog fanatic. I wasn't playing at the time, but it's cut <laughs> such a groove into history. How could I forget it? Awesome, man. Well, um, hopefully we'll have you on the show again before long. In the meantime, take it easy, Michael. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for having me. <laughs>